Well, hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. My name is Jessica Likewise. I'm studying for my BCPA exam and I'm making videos every day to help you study along with me. Today, I'm gonna to talk about the difference between a respondent and operant behavior and obviously the difference between respondent and operant condition. So stay tuned. <music> Hey guys, and welcome back. Like I said, today I'm going to define a respondent behavior and respondent conditioning and an operant behavior and operant conditioning. So what's the difference between the two? Well, respondent conditioning or respondent behavior was first developed by Watson and was later made popular by Pavlov in his famous experiment with the dogs. And we probably all know about that, right? He noticed that if a dog salivated, every time a dog salivated every time they saw food. Now, my dog does that all the time. I didn't teach him how to do it. He didn't learn how to do it. His mom didn't teach him how to do it. He just naturally knew how to do it, right? It was a reflexive behavior. It was an unlearned behavior. All respondent behavior is behavior that's untrained, unlearned. The person is naturally born with it or the animal's naturally born with it. It's a reflexive behavior. What brings it out or elicits it is a antecedent or a stimulus in the environment. So in this case, right, food is eliciting a dog salivating. The stimulus food or antecedent food is what's causing that behavior. It's not anything that happens after it. So respondent behavior always has to do what happens before behavior and it is always unlearned. So in the experiment with Pavlov, what he did is he noticed that he could condition a dog to salivate when he paired the stimulus of food with another stimulus. So there's a neutral stimulus and then there's the unconditioned stimulus, which is the stimulus that of the food. And he conditioned a stimulus to be by pairing it. So what he did was he took a bell. And that sounds really complicated. And it, it, the, it can seem like that, but it's easy. So I'll make it easy. So we have the bell, right? And he took this bell and he rang this bell just before he presented food. And then he presented the food immediately after ringing the bell. And then the dog eventually after enough times was conditioned. And this was again, not a choice, but it was a reflex it was conditioned that when he rang the bell, the dog would salivate. Now, why? Because the bell was being paired with the food as the stimulus. Now, eventually, if you stop pairing the two, let's just say you rang a bell every hour on the hour and there was never food presented, then the, the behavior would become unpaired, right? So it would be extinguished. The dog would no longer, again, this is neurological, so I'm saying associate, but the dog's not consciously associating it but the bell would no longer bring out the reflexive behavior of salivating, right? So that's different than operant conditioning. Operant conditioning was developed by Skinner. And what he just found out is that the consequence that follows a behavior affects how likely that behavior is to occur in the future. Operant conditioning is primarily what we use when we're doing ABA therapy. That is our primary method of, um, of doing conditioning. So what that says is that what happens after a behavior determines whether or not it's going to occur more or less frequently. So operant behavior is a choice. It is learned, it is social, it is something that someone chooses to engage in. So we're gonna continue on the example of a dog and we're gonna talk about my dog Lucky, partially just because I love him a lot and He's amazing. And partially because I just want to keep consistency in this example. So I go to yoga. My dog, especially after we've all been home for a long time, every single time I leave my house, my dog expresses his displeasure about me leaving my home by destroying things, by biting on furniture and chewing things up. So I put my dog in his cage. Every time I go to yoga, I lock my dog in his cage and I leave the house. So what began to happen, I guess, is that, and my dog, and I didn't teach this, but my dog was taught this naturally, is every time I picked up my yoga mat, I would then say, Lucky, go into your cage, and he would go in his cage, and then he would get locked in his cage, and I would leave my house. Well, eventually, now, when I pick up my yoga mat, I don't even need to tell Lucky to go in his cage. I just pick up my yoga mat, the dog looks at me, and he sighs, and then he walks into his cage, and he lays down, and I lock the cage, and close the door, and I leave the house. 
So now Lucky's um, now this can seem confusing because people can say, well, well, isn't it the yoga mat that's actually making Lucky um, go in, into his cage? Yes, but the behavior is being maintained by the consequence of me closing the cage and the d -d door cage and then leaving the house, right? That's what's maintaining this behavior. So Lucky now is engaging in this behavior voluntarily. He it is something he learned. It's caused by a consequence. It is an operant behavior. It is operant conditioning. So if we want a child to say, greet a, a peer at the playground, and every time he greets the peer in the playground, we say, hey, you did a really good job, or maybe give him a sticker or high five or a piece of candy, whatever it is that we're doing, that is all operant conditioning where you're giving a consequence and the consequence is what's affecting behavior. So all respondent behavior is unlearned all operant behavior is learned, all respondent behavior is caused by a stimulus, all respondent behavior is being caused by a consequence. Now, the way in which you would untrain a behavior, let's say I really didn't want Lucky to pick up, to go into the cage every time I picked up my yoga mat. What I would do is let's say I have another yoga mat in my car and now I'm gonna pick up my yoga mat every couple hours, I'm gonna move it around the house and then Lucky goes into his cage. Well, the consequence of me locking the cage door and leaving the house doesn't occur. The consequence is what was maintaining the behavior. So not the yoga mat. The yoga mat was not maintaining the behavior. The consequence of me locking Lucky in the house and leaving, that's what was maintaining the behavior. So if I stop doing that, and let's just say I pick up my yoga mat and I move it from the living room to the kitchen, and then I pick up my yoga mat and I move it from the kitchen to the dining room. I mean, I don't even have a dining room. I have like a 600 square foot apartment, but let's just pretend that I live in this enormous house and I pick up my yoga mat and move it all around and Lucky goes in this cage every time. And then the consequence is never there of me locking him in this cage and leaving, eventually it's going, he's going to stop doing that, right? So that's called extinction, though the behavior of Lucky going there, it's no longer conditioned. So I really hope that this has helped you to um, make it really clear. I tried to give you really clear examples. It's super confusing at first, but one of the ways that I like to do it, because sometimes if you overanalyze things, you can kind of think, like I said, with the yucky, Lucky in the yoga mat, it's like, well, maybe the yoga mats is stimulus and that's making the behavior. So if you can overcomplicate this, but in order to not overcomplicate this, just remember respondent behavior is unlearned, operant behavior is learned. Respondent behavior is the stimulus um, and respond, uh, res operant behavior is the consequences. Um, operant behavior, or excuse me, respondent behavior is a reflex where uh, operant behavior is a choice. So if you just remember that, then it will be clear every single example, which one it is. So I, found, I hope you found this helpful. Um, subscribe to this channel. I'm making videos just like this multiple times a day when we're studying because we're in this together. And also because I do believe we're in this together and I want you to be successful. All of my study notes are on my website, hopeeducationservices.com. They're on the blog. They're not formally edited. They're not written out as long form blog posts, but everything you need to study is on there. So go check it out, get your study notes. Um, sharing is caring and I'm putting them on there to share with you. So I'll see you on the next video. And if you have a question, don't hesitate to reach out on my website because if you need to know it, I need to know it and let's study.